Listen only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Society of Wetland Scientists March webinar. My name is Bianca Wenzel, and I'm going to be your moderator today. The general format for today's webinar will be about a 40 minute presentation by our speaker, and then we'll have approximately 10, 15 minutes for questions and announcements at the end. So make sure you get a chance to stay on if you have questions to ask or want to hear those answers. I want to offer a special welcome to any of our non-member guests that we have joining us today for our quarterly free webinar. All of our webinars are complimentary to SWS members, but once a quarter we open it up to the public. Our next free quarterly webinar will be held in June. Before we get started with the presentation today, I'd like to give all of our guests a quick overview of what the Society of Wetland Scientists is all about. Since its founding in 1980, the Society of Wetland Scientists has continued to grow with more than 3,000 members from around the world. We are committed to providing our members meaningful resources that promote wetland education, conservation, and restoration globally. In addition to the complimentary monthly webinars, SWS membership includes full access to the Wetlands Journal, Wetland Science and Practice, and other professional journals. We also offer discounted rates for the professional certification program, access to regional chapter and section activities, discounted registration at our annual SWS meetings, and the opportunity to network with wetland professionals from around the world. Please visit our website to learn more about our member benefits. We are especially proud to announce that this webinar has been pre-approved by the SWS Professional Certification Program and is applicable for 0 .06 continuing education credits that can be applied to your Professional Wetland Scientist certification application or renewal. As a reminder, participation certificates are available upon request as well. Please contact SWS staff if you're interested. Certificates are also available for those who watch webinar recordings. All webinars are recorded and archived for complimentary viewing by members on our past webinars page. Before we get started, why don't we take a moment to familiarize you with the GoToWebinar system. On the right side of your screen, you should see a control panel that looks like the one on uh, the example slide here. In the audio pane, you can adjust the webinar audio by using your telephone or computer speakers. At any time during the presentation, you can type your questions into the questions pane. Our presenter will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. If you would like a copy of today's slides, please find a PDF copy in the handouts pane of the control panel. We also ask that you take a moment to complete the evaluation survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. In addition, we encourage you to use the hashtag SWSWebinar on Twitter to tweet about today's webinar if you wish. Now let's just take a moment uh, to test the questions pane. And at the same time, we'll be able to get some demographics by having everyone type the state or country that you are participating from. So just take a moment um, to type that into the questions panel. So I see we have a bunch of people from Florida. Uh, we have Colorado. Um, Canada, Minnesota, Vermont. There's a whole bunch typing in. Thank you guys. So the questions pane is working 
And it seems like we have people from a bunch of areas and this side of the world, it looks like. Okay, very good. Uh, so with the logistics out of the way, we can uh, now talk about our presenter. So it is my distinct pleasure to welcome today's presenter, Amr Keshta. Uh, I'm particularly excited about this because uh, Keshta was our very first wetland ambassador for the year 2017. Um, at SWS, the Wetland Ambassador Graduate Research Fellowship Program allows graduate students to travel to another country and conduct groundbreaking wetland research with some of the world's top wetland research scientists. Keshta completed his master's degree in environmental science at Tanti University in Egypt in 2011. And he just recently returned from his Wetland Ambassador Fellowship um, that he conducted at the University of Hamburg in Germany, where he was under the mentorship of Dr. Kai Jensen. Amr Keshta is passionate about studying carbon cycling in wetlands, wetland biogeochemistry, sediment dynamics, soil carbon stocks, wetland hydrodynamics, climate change, and wetland restoration. His graduate research involved the application of remote sensing tools to aid in the prediction of the impact of sea level rise on coastal wetlands. He also studies greenhouse gas emissions and their global impact on coastal wetlands and wildlife habitats. Uh, so with that, welcome to Keshta and I will turn it over to you for your presentation. Oh, um, thank you, Bianca, so much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. And uh, thank you for everybody who is joining us for March SWS webinar. And uh, today I will talk about the research proposal that I did back in Germany in uh, October 2017 with my colleague uh, Stephanie Lalti. Um, uh, she, most of the time I was working with her and she was supposed to be with us today, but for some reason she can't. So this research proposal was funded by a uh, Society of Wetland Scientists uh, after I get the Wetland Ambassador Fellowship, which I was very excited about it. And uh, other fund come from uh, the Graduate School of University of Maryland, College Park, where I did my PhD. And from my department as well, Department of Environmental Science and Technology, and with some funding from University of Hamburg. So, how I get there? I'm a wetland lover, and once I heard about the Wetland Ambassador Fellowship provided by Society of Wetland Scientists, I was very excited to give it a shot and apply, and I was even more excited when I received the letter from Society of Wetland Scientists. Yes, you are selected to be the first wetland ambassador to travel to Hamburg, Germany, and to do more groundbreaking wetland research. Bim, I was super excited about this. So, uh, just to give you a little bit of overview where I was, I was like doing the research at the Wedding Sea region in Germany, and this was University of Hamburg, and normally, I study wetlands at the Chesapeake Bay area region in uh, uh, Maryland. So to give you a little bit of overview about the wedding sea, it's uh, uh, extended for three different countries, Denmark, Germany, and the Netherlands. And this is how the cost without humans, we do have our sea here, this is our salt marshes, this is the river. And basically, these are the kind of grazing that is going there. It's mainly sheep. So after a while, uh, they start building the seawall. And once we build the seawall, sediment deposition start 
becoming more available in the front of the wall and then all the grazing become in the front of the wall because the marshes start to grow there. Then more human impacts are uh, growing up like agriculture, uh, building more houses and then as a result for this after building the seawall uh, we do have subsidence and that result in this area become under the sea level right under the sea level where they need to pump out all the water in front of the seawall and then they start introducing this idea of artificial marshes where they dig some ditches to deliver the hydrology to these marshes and you can see them here they are very straight line salt marshes that's why they call them artificial this is not the case in a natural uh, system for salt marshes. So, to give you an idea about how is the vegetation look like there, um, I know the terminology a little bit different between Germany and the US. So, normally in US we call this area here uh, mudflat, but they go there by pioneer zone. And so the pioneer zone is uh, very low in terms of species richness. So, we do have Salicornia and sometimes we do have Spartania anglica. And in terms of low marsh compared to the pioneer zone, it's even species rich because it has more species available like Oxenolia, Atriplex, Artemisia, Aster. So the species richness at the low marsh is higher compared to the pioneer zone. And then we come back to the high marsh area all the way up here where we have species richness less compared to the low marsh where we have maybe only one plant species or two and the most dominant was alums. So the national park and the grazing. So once uh, the awareness raised about the national park is the grazing impact on the salt marshes decreased tremendously. So it was in 1980s, it was almost about 90% when it's 2013, it become about almost 40%. So this is an image here between two different sites that we will be talking about today. On your left side here, this is the ungrazed marsh. And on the right side, this is the grazed marsh. And what I need to point out here is that based on this study, the number of species start to increase and come back to higher species richness by 2000. So with this background, we have two main research objectives. The first one is assessing the effect of grazing on soil structure and its influence on hydrology in salt marshes, and quantifying the microbial activity as a proxy for the decomposition of organic matter. So we do have four hypotheses that we test. So soil at the grazed salt marshes would have higher soil bulk density with low carbon content or lower organic matter content compared to the ungrazed marsh and also the grazed salt marshes will have shallower water level where the water will be very close to the soil surface compared to the ungrazed and also they will have lower porosity more dense sediment and poor connectivity so while i was in germany i tried to learn german uh, to my best and i tried to pronounce these two names they are in german so i just go by dsk and snk sorry about that so this is the SNK site and the DSK site, both of them are in the coastal salt marshes of the Wadden Sea. And basically, while I was there, I stayed there to participate in three different projects. The first one was the hydrology. Uh, we looked for water level, flooding frequency, rate of water drainage, and we did a CT scanning for some soil cores to look for water-filled pores versus air-filled pores sediment density, porosity, and connectivity. And we did some uh, research about soil structure. We looked for soil bulk density, carbon content, moisture content. 
So for the hydrology project, um, so this project was going on since 2014 until I was there. So I wasn't uh, there while they deployed the wells and they do all the measurements. They did very good job there. So I just dealing with the data. Uh, so we look for water level for post sites was recorded every five minutes and the use um, uh, PVC wells where they are slotted, as you can see him here, and pressure sensors. So the data that I will be sharing you, sharing with you today, is just for year of 2016. So uh, here on our uh, in the y-axis we have the water table dips, and this is the soil surface. And here on x-axis we have the time frame. This is a, a year. And you can see here, this is the grid site, and this is the ungrazed. So from the first glance, you will see the water level at the grazed is more closer to the soil surface compared to the ungrazed. And also, water drain is lower at the ungrazed marsh. So I just zoomed in for um, some of the very interesting peaks here that I will discuss more. So this is the season of summer 2016. We just zoomed in to the data to look for these peaks here. And uh, when we went back to check our hypothesis, we said grazed marshes would have shallower water level. Yes, they are very close to the soil surface compared to the ungrazed one. But it turns out that water drained slower at the ungrazed site. So if you look here, or here, or here, for example, these are the grazed water level. It drains very fast after they reach their peak, while the ungrazed, it takes a little bit longer to reach to their normal level after a flooding event or a spring tide. So that's very interesting, and I will come back to this in a minute. So the second project that I was participating there, uh, we made a collaboration with Dr. Ergen Tichak. He is a sedimentologist at University of Bremen, Germany, at the Center for Marine Environmental Science, where we did our um, computer tomography or CT scanning. To give you a little bit of overview, um, I went to the CT scan facility in my entire life twice. The first time when I broke my arm, so I went there to make an X-ray scanning. And the second time when I was in Germany. So we collected intact cores. Uh, we collected eight cores to compare between grazed and ungrazed. We bring them to the hospital. There is a CT scan facility. And these are my colleague, is, uh, is Stephanie Nolte. And this is my colleague, Ergen Techek. And these are the technician at the hospital at Meram where we did the soil CT scan. And here, uh, where I stayed for two weeks uh, at the Premier University at the office of Mike Leek Bergen. So, what kind of information can we obtain from the CT scanning? So, we have our cores. They are 50 centimeter deep, and we go by slice. Each slice is 0.3 millimeter. So I will walk you through this picture here, and I have a nice video for this too. So basically, this core here, this is column one. This is just like an X-ray image for the raw core after two millimeter trimmed and removed from the core to avoid any kind of artifact. On column two, we are viewing air-filled pores in greenish color. You'll see them, this is spots versus water-filled or root-filled pores in blue color. In column three, here are the pores, but representing in a different way, where same color, these are the pores that are connected to each other. And when you have a different color, this is a different pore. So basically, same color, they are connected pores, different color, they are disconnected pores. Here, uh, what we call matrix sediment density, and I would like to differentiate here between the regular soil bulk density that we do at the lab, where it is the weight of dry soil over volume. This is something different, 
uh, which we call matrix sediment density or sediment density to show you how dense the sediment is per each layer. And you can see here, the more redder, the more dense the sediment is. This is the porosity, and these are calculated based on the pore volume relative to the volume of sediment and, um, um, and the pores. So the redder, higher porosity, and on the last column here, we are viewing the pores, but in a different way. These are the pores where they do represent the diameter of each pore. So blue will be thin color, thin pore in terms of diameter, while the red will be pore with a thicker diameter. So how we did this, uh, I will show you uh, the video on how we did it. So basically, this is the core, just after we scan it from the CT scan facility. Then we took the two millimeter out to avoid any kind of artifact. And this is the core where we looked for the entire core to see different uh, pores, like pores that are filled with water versus pores that are filled with air. And then these are the sediment density. You can see the layers with the red color. This is dense sediment. This is porosity as a red color is more or higher porosity. And then these are the core in a 3D dimension where we are rotating it and create a center line to measure the diameter of each pore. And you can see here all the pores that have the same color would be connected pore. And the pores that has different color will be disconnected pores. Go back to our presentation here. Um, some data about the CT scanning. So we do have two different treatment, grazed marshes and ungrazed marshes. And to show you how they look like, here, so on the top side from the screen, this is the grazed marsh, and on the lower side, this is the ungrazed marsh. So basically, from the first glance, if you look just for the cores, especially in the first top 20 centimeter, here you can see more spaces like air spaces. The soil is less compacted compared to the grazed one. And also, this is very interesting to compare pores for ungrazed marshes versus pores for grazed marshes. Here, all the way up to almost 30 centimeter, all the pores are well connected to each other because you do have the same color here, while at the grazed ones, you are less connected. Also, the sediment here, the grazed one, because of trampling, the sediment become even more denser. So you can see here, higher sediment density or metric system compared to the ungrazed one. And very interesting, the porosity for the ungrazed, it's higher porosity and connectivity compared to the grazed marsh. And I, as I was talking about the hydrology, so if you remember this graph here, we said the water at the ungrazed marsh, it looks like it takes longer time to be drained which means the water stay there for longer time compared to the grazed one. And this might be related to how the pores are connected together. In the ungrazed one, we do have the pores connected well together up to 30 centimeters, where at the grazed one, the pores are disconnected. So in terms of metric sediment dynasty, and again, I would like to differentiate here between the sediment density that we got from the soil CT scanning versus the regular soil bulk density. So the regular soil bulk density, you will have the units by gram per each cubic centimeter, for example. But here we have a Hansfield unit. This is from the X-ray. So here, if we look for the, the salt marshes that is grazed, versus the ungrazed, you can clearly see the grazed one has higher sediment layers compared to the ungrazed one. In terms of porosity, the ungrazed, especially at the first 20 or 15 centimeter, the ungrazed have higher porosity compared to the grazed one. 
and you can see here clearly the porosity is like the more redder, the higher porosity it is. Here we are looking for connectivity, and here we are representing connectivity as number of disconnected pore per slice. So basically, here you will have in the first top 15 centimeter or 20 centimeter the number of disconnected pores at the grazed one is higher compared to the ungrazed, which means ungrazed, all the pores are well connected, so they retain water for longer time, and we did see this in the hydrology. So here, uh, I'm only viewing the ungrazed marsh where we differentiate between the pores that are filled with air versus the pores that are filled with water and the sediment. So this is just volume per each slice. And here the sediment will be way higher, but the air filled pores will be only peaking at the top five centimeters and then it goes down and then most of the water filled pores will be in this range. So um, I have a nice video here to show you on comparing the grazed versus ungrazed marsh. So here, so here you are looking for two different cores. This one here on your right, this is the grazed, and you can see it is dense compared to the ungrazed one. Here we are looking for porosity. The, uh, this one and this one here, here is, these are the pores. I will just leave it to you to watch, and then maybe we can talk more about it during the discussion. These are the boards here, they are very well connected in the ungrazed marsh compared to the grazed marsh. Okay, back to our presentation. So the third and the last project that I participated was the soil pulp ministry. So, we already collected the cores and they are undisturbed because after you scan them, nothing happened to them. So we side open them from here so we can take our samples for the soil bulk analysis. So we looked for the carbon content and I would like to take a chance here and thank Diana Richer. She is the one who showed me how to use the CHN analyzer where we logged for carbon content and the nitrogen content. So let's get to some data. So here, this is the average soil bulk density, the regular bulk density that we get at our labs, gram per each cubic centimeter. It's just like the weight or dry weight of soil per a specific volume. So here, the grazed site has a higher soil bulk density compared to the ungrazed site. And this is for post site SNK and DSK. But the significant effect is not significant. So the, the difference between soil bulk density in grazed and ungrazed, they are not significantly different. So when we test for hypothesis, we said, yes, the grazed marshes have higher soil bulk density, but the treatment effect is not significant. For the carbon content, yes, the ungrazed marshes have higher carbon content compared to the ungrazed at both sides. So for example, SNK, this is the grazed, this is ungrazed compared to the grazed. At this case, the ungrazed have higher carbon content compared to the grazed one. And this might be due to uh, you have less grazing, so the plants grow better, and all these plants die back to increase the input for organic material. So for moisture content, um, the D a DSK site, the grazed site, the ungrazed one has higher moisture content inside the soil. 
So when we look even deeper, instead of taking the average, we look through the soil profile. This is the soil carbon at SNK, and you can see here, the carbon content goes down by depth at both sides. And also you can see here, the ungrazed marshes have higher carbon content compared to the grazed, especially in the first 15 centimeters. For soil bulk density, soil bulk density here over soil profiles, it goes up by depth. The deeper you go, the higher bulk density you will get. And here you can easily see that the soil bulk density for the grazed marshes are higher than the ungrazed. So the other part of this, to look for the exoenzyme activity, as a proxy for soil organic material decomposition. And this will be done during the spring 2018 with my colleague, Hao Chang. He is a PhD student studying salt marshes at Hamburg University, Germany. So while I was there, uh, I get a chance to see an amazing experiment where they study the effect of raise, rising temperature on salt marshes. So here at the side, these are the different plots, and these are the cables that go under the ground. So we do have underground rising temperature and above ground as well. So this is done in cooperation between uh, CERC, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center here at USA, and uh, the group of Kai Jensen, my host mentor at University of Hamburg, Germany, and with cooperation between Roy, Roy Rich and Patrick Migoni. And please, if you need more information uh, about uh, site history and the history of salt marshes at the Wedding Sea, you can look for this report. And by that, I would like to take the chance to thank everybody who makes this happen. I would like to thank my advisors at University of Maryland, USA, Andy Baldwin, Stephanie Yerward, and also I would like to thank my host mentor, Kai Jensen, University of Hamburg, Germany. I would like to thank Stephanie Nolte, I already missed her during this presentation. And Peter Miller, who helped me with some field visits and some lab analysis at University of Hamburg, Germany. Also, I would like to thank Ergen Tetschak and Kitea. These are our collaborator at University of Bremen, Germany, where we did our soil CT scanning. With that, I would like to thank everybody. I would like to thank our attendance moderators. And now I will hand the presentation back to Bianca. Okay, thank you very much, Keshta. Um, I know that that was really cool. <laughs> I think the CT scanning was really neat. I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, and now we can take some time to get to the questions and answer session. Um, so if you have any questions, please type them into the question pane and I will read your questions that I have received to Keshta directly. Um, if you forget to ask a question or if you have to leave before we finish, you can email Keshta directly at the email address listed on the slide here. Um, so please take a moment to think of any questions that you might like to ask Keshta and you can type those into the question pane and we can get started. So one question that we have here is, um, Keshta, you mention uh, connectivity and porosity in your CT scan images, and we were wondering how you calculate them. 
Yes, uh, let me pull out the slide here, so it will make way easier. Okay, so PES play porosity and connectivity. So these are the columns where we represent porosity, and this is a pro the proxy for connectivity. So in terms of porosity, these are a percentage of volume of pores per each slice relative to the total volume of pores and sediment. So it's a percentage for porosity. And here you can see for the color coding, the more redder, the higher porosity it is. So for example, the ungrazed marsh, the soil is less compacted compared to the grazed marsh. And you can see this here. These are the sediment layer, which is way dense compared to the ungrazed, especially in the first top 30 centimeter, I would say. In terms of connectivity, so basically here, you can see that we are representing connectivity as number of disconnected pores per each slice. So, so think about it this way. The more disconnected bore you have, the less connectivity you will get. And the more connected pores and all the pores are connected to each other, the higher connectivity. So for example here, an ungrazed marsh, the soil is less compacted, so more pores are connected to each other. That's why they are getting the same color coding here, compared to the grazed marsh, where the soil is very compacted, so more pores, but they are disconnected. And you can see here very clearly in the first 30 centimeters. And when we go to this graph here, so here I'm presenting number of disconnected pores per each slice. So the grazed marsh is because the soil is compacted. You do have a lot of disconnected pores here, and they do have different color coding. That's why they are too high here. Compared to the ungrazed marsh, where you do have a very well connected pores network and that gives you a higher connectivity so the numbers of disconnected pores at the ungrazed one will be way lower compared to the grazed and i think this will play a very important role in the pattern that we see at the hydrology here this is the ungrazed and this is the grazed so the red one is the grazed the water come back very quickly so it doesn't hold the soil too much while the water at the ungrade side it does take a little bit longer to come back to their normal average okay thank you kesha um the next question that we have is from lynn cudlip and she's asking, can you describe the intensity and frequency of grazing at each of the sites? Uh, okay. Uh, for this, I will do my best, if I remember correctly. So they do have um, uh, grazing plants where they do have some sites. They allow the sheep, so the grazing mainly sheep. So they allow the 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 for a specific time frame like five years and then they switch between other sites and if you need more information I would refer to slide number 49 you will find here even more information about how frequent it is and the management plan for letting sheep go grazing versus ungrazing. Okay, 
Um, we have another question about grazing also, which may have a similar answer from James Robertson, and that is about the timeline. So what was the timeline for grazing with relation to the experiment itself? So for this, um, so the grazing at this site, once the idea of establishing the national park back in 1980s, the grazing impact decreased tremendously in 1980s to nowadays. So since the 1980s, the grazing went down from almost 90% to 40%, so it's almost half percent down. And here in this figure, you can see, uh, starting from 2000, the number of species richness or the species riches starts to coming back again around 2000. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is um, for your hydrology data specifically, um, you show that ungrazed marshes, they retain water for a longer period of time compared to the grazed. How does that relate to the connectivity in pore spaces? Yes, that's a very good question. So basically, here we did our hypothesis saying because the grazed will be very compacted, so the water will be retained longer. But in fact, when we look for our hydrology, if you look here, yes, the water level at the grazed site is shallower compared to the ungrazed, but the time that, so let's say this is a storm event or a spring tide event. So basically the time the water will take to come back to their normal average is way longer compared to the time that water will take at the grazed marsh. So when we look for this and comparing this to the connectivity figure, so here, as I said, in column three and column six, here we are viewing the pores that are connected together. So the pores that are connected, they get the same color, as I said, and if they are disconnected, they get different color. And here, because the pores are well connected at the ungrazed side, the, you can return the water for longer time compared to the grazed one. And this is why we get this retention time here, like the water will take longer time as ungrazed side. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Allison Warner, who's wondering about the effect of thatch. Um, she says, in the U.S., we have seen grazing used in the fall to remove thatch to help in native forb and grass species recovery. Has there been any work done on this? Uh, I, I don't know. My only experience with the grazing effect was the first time when I traveled to Germany. So I really didn't know about the grazing effects in U.S. I haven't done any research on this in U.S. yet. I think um, the question might be about if there has been work done on this in the area you studied with thatch in particular. Uh, I, I really didn't know. I don't know. Okay. This might be a question that I can ask my colleagues at University of Hamburg and then come back and send an email with the answer. Okay, and, and Allison, if you're listening, you can certainly send Keshta an email um, to ask more specifically about this as well. Um, does anyone have any additional questions? I'll give you a minute if you have any last minute things you want to ask Keshta. Oh, 
Okay, I think that is all the questions. So if, um, Keshta, if there was anything else you wanted to add, uh, you certainly can do that. Otherwise, we can go to um, the next webinar slide. Uh, I think I'm okay. Um, and I would like to thank everybody who managed to make it and attend our March uh, webinar. And I can tell you this, that was a fantastic opportunity for me to travel outside US and do more wetland research. I'm a wetland lover and uh, I always say the more wetland this you see, the more experience about wetland you will get. And the floor is yours, Bianca. All right. Well, uh, just before we, we close for today, I just wanted to announce our next webinar. So please mark your calendars for our next webinar, which will be held on Thursday, April 19th at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern. We hope to see you there. We're always looking for future webinar presenters and topics. So if any of you in the audience are interested in presenting an SWS webinar, or if you have a topic of interest you would like to see us cover, please indicate this in the evaluation survey you will receive after the conclusion of the webinar or contact SWS headquarters. And, um, a little announcement. Registration for our 2018 annual meeting is now open. Please join us if you can from May 29th to June 1st, 2018 in Denver, Colorado. Um, there's also still some time to submit your children's artwork to our SWS Youth Art Contest. We'll be accepting art until April 2nd, and you can learn more about this submission process at sws.org. So with that, thank you so much, Keshta, for taking time out of your schedule to present an SWS webinar. Thank you for being our very first wetland ambassador and thanks also to our audience for attending today we hope you can all join us for our upcoming webinar next month thanks everyone have a good day